Will the Trojans be able to take the Huskies to the pound? Will the women's soccer team be able to rebound when they take on the teams from the desert this weekend? Find out all about this and more on Sports Scene. Welcome into the beautiful Julie Chen and Leslie Moonves in CBS Media Center. I'm Jackson Safon. And I'm Connor McGlynn. The number 17 USC football team is back in action in an unusual Thursday night primetime matchup against the University of Washington at the Coliseum. The Pac-12 battle has an added boost of interest as it's the first time head coach Steve Sarkeesian and five members of his assistant coaching staff, including Justin Wilcox, Peter Sermon, Keith Hayward, Johnny Nansen, and Marcus Tuiasosopo are facing their former team since joining the Trojans in 2014. We caught up with some of the coaches to get their feelings on the reunion. I respect those guys a bunch. I recruited them. They're good kids. They play hard. Um, you know, I know that I want to win, uh, just like every other football game. So I think my, my feelings are, are really clear. You know, regardless of who it is coming in this week, even though it is Washington, I had a great time there. Uh, my outlook is that we just got to do, do what we need to do to win. So Jackson, with USC coming off the bye and Notre Dame looming, this could be somewhat of a trap game for USC. Do you think that they're going to fall into that trend, or will the Sark reunion kind of take precedent? Well, the Notre Dame game is always one of the biggest of the year. Traveling to South Bend next week to take on a rival that's ranked in the top 15 in the country is definitely on the minds of most USC fans, but I think Sark and the coaching staff are focused on this week. Having the extra bye week off, plus going up against Sark's former team, I think it's going to really have them focused for Washington. I think that the reunion will definitely play a factor into it and keep them focused, but they're going to need to continue to play at an upper level because with over 40 players from Southern California on this Husky team and over 30 that were recruited by Sark himself to play for UW, it's going to be a little difficult and they're going to really want this win. USC is a 17-point favorite on Thursday. What are your keys for the game for the Trojans to come out on top? I think if USC wants to win this game, they're going to need to establish a run game early. Washington comes into this game with the top total defense in the Pac-12 and also the top rushing defense, allowing just 104.5 yards a game. So if USC wants to pull ahead like they're expected to, they can't struggle like they did against ASU. They need to be able to establish themselves. Trey Madden needs to be able to make holes for himself, and Ronald Jones and uh, Justin Davis need to be able to reach the second level. I completely agree, but for me, the key for the Trojans is playing clean and not beating themselves. Simply put, USC is a lot better than Washington. They're a lot more talented. So in, or in order for them to come out on top, they're going to need to win the turnover battle and the penalty battle. So there's no doubt setting the tone on the ground and limiting mistakes will be pivotal to the Trojan's success. But to give a little bit more of an in-depth look to how USC and UW match up in all three phases, I'll send it over to Jackson at the monitor. Thanks, Connor. I'm now joined by Paolo Ugetti to help figure out which team has the advantage in this week's matchup against the Huskies. So, Paolo, USC's offense has been one of the most explosive in the Pac-12 in the Pac-12 conference, leading the conference with 46.8 points per game. How does Washington's offense compare? Washington's offense, they have a very balanced offense. They run 120 plays, uh, rushing plays, and 119 rushing plays. The problem is that they, don't have as, they haven't been able to run the ball consistently well. Their top two running backs averaging 5.2 per, uh, yards per rush combined, but they haven't given them enough carries. So Washington's offense has been really lacking in that sense. Obviously, you got freshman Jake Browning there. You know, he's, he's kind of a phenom. He's getting uh, people excited. But he, he's been on and off. He's had four interceptions. So it's a struggling, developing offense that they have. And obviously, USC's offense with Juju and Cody, Trey Madden, Justin Davis, and the whole stable of running backs, they have a lot of talent. And so I really think the nod's got to go to USC. I agree. Now on to defense. Washington and USC have the first and second ranked scoring defenses in the Pac-12, respectively, even after UW lost three first-round talents to the NFL draft in Danny Shelton, Marcus Peters, and Shaq Thompson. So who really has the advantage in this game? You know, it's hard to say because USC's defense has really been on and off. They've really struggled against the run in Washington's run game. We saw it, it can be potentially dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, as far as the edge goes in this game, I'm going to give the edge to Washington because they're num the number one rush defense in the Pac-12. They've allowed... Um, only uh, less than three yards per carry to teams. And they're, they're, really, uh, they're really, like Sark said, mentioned, he mentioned earlier this week, they have a, a bunch of players who can really st stop the run and really keep uh, players from getting to the outside. So I'm gonna give the F edge to, to Washington. As far as USC's defense go, they're, they're getting Kevon Seymour back this week, which is really gonna help their secondary. And so I think that their pass defense is gonna really make it tough for Jake Browning with Kevon, Adori, Chris Hawkins. The secondary's been playing pretty well. 
And I think the run defense, like you said, UW's run offense, they've been efficient, but they haven't given them enough carries. I think that USC does just enough to stop the run, and they, they, the pass defense is really strong. So I'm going to give the, the nod to USC. Now, special teams is one of those things that can really make or break the game and is one of the things that can really swing the needle. So who, do you, who has the advantage in the special teams? Well, personally, I think as long as Adore is back there returning punts and kickoffs, USC has to have the edge in this, no matter how good you know, uh, Washington's punt return coverage it, uh, is. But you know, we saw what Adore can do uh, in the Arizona State game when he had that really the turnaround in the, on, the, mm -hmm. on the punt return. So I think just by the fact of having Adore on the kick and punt returns, I think USC has to have the edge on it. OK, well, Washington. You're going to have a tough time with the Dory, but they have a dynamic punt returner of their own. Dante Pettis, the brother of former Boise State wide receiver Austin Pettis, has been averaging over 20 yards per punt return, which is towards the top of the conference. And he's really explosive. He took one all the way to the house against Boise State in their opener. And I think he's really dynamic. UW also has one of the top punt return, punt coverage units. They're allow allowing opponents less than one yard per punt return. So I really think UW's got a pretty good special teams unit, and I'm going to give the advantage to them. Mm -hmm. Now, we both have a slight edge to USC, 2-1, to one, so give me a little Paolo's prediction. And, uh, you know, it, with uh, the Notre, Notre Dame game next week, I think USC could potentially look at this as a trap game, so they need to be careful. But I think that they'll take care of the Thursday night game at home. I'll say 35-10 USC. Well, that's all for our breakdown. And the usual game day feel is out the window this week with the Trojans playing on Thursday. So we sent sports scene's Haley Tucker into the field to ask students what they do differently for weekday games. How do students feel about our upcoming Thursday football game instead of the normal Saturday game? I'm Haley Tucker out here on the streets of Troy to find out. Tailgating is part of the experience. I think tailgating should stay on campus even if it's a Thursday game. I think that's fine personally because it is like a school day and I think like it'd be distracting. I don't know. I think it's pretty stupid. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a good I, I think that like 60% of college football culture comes with tailgating. So I don't think that uh, not tailgating on campus is a good idea because so many of USC's fans are alumni. I have class from 6 to 8, so I'll be missing the game. Because students pay for their season tickets, so they should be able to go to the game instead of going to class. I would go if, even if I just didn't have class Thursday. So if, if, even if I had class Friday, I still would have gone. And my lab was canceled, so... I won't be missing the game. What's the clear consensus for USC students? Cancel class on Thursday. Thanks, Haley. Hopefully the student section will be as lively as they are on Saturdays. But now over to Connor McGlynn with a special in-studio guest. Thanks, Jackson. Moving from the Trojans on the gridiron at the Coliseum to the women of Troy on the pitch at McAllister Field, I'm joined by USC women's soccer junior defender, Mandy Freeman. Thanks for joining me, Mandy. Of course. So you've always been known as a real strong defender, but this year you're getting more involved on in the offensive attack, a goal, three assists so far. <laughs> How have you incorporated that into your game? Um, defense is definitely a, a big aspect of what I um, am about. I'm a strong defender. Pretty much everyone knows that. So um, I think it helps with the team to kind of just move me a little higher up the field so we can start the defense a little bit early and take some of the pressure off of our back line. Um, and I think the defense just helps offensively because like a good offense starts with a good defense to get the ball. Um, and so I think that's just my, my role with the team. You guys are off to a, a big start so far, 7-4-1, and one, winning five of the last seven. How impressed are you with this team so far? I'm really impressed. I'm super excited for the rest of the season. We know um, with the new coaching staff, it's our second year, so we're pretty much getting into the, the swing of things here. And um, I think we had a great start, and we're just looking to keep the momentum moving forward. Defensively, you guys have only given up eight goals in the first 12 games. What have been some of the points of emphasis to shut down some of the best offenses in the nation? Um, the Pretty much the, the point is what our coaches like to stress the most is just um, to not let them get the ball at all and so try to start the defense as higher up the field as possible so that when we win the ball we're in their half and not in ours and um, just to really keep their pressure on so that they can't serve it into the box. Talking about that pressure in a different light this time you guys <laughs> coming in this season you're expected to finish or predicted to finish uh, third in the conference last year is 11th yeah. how much pressure does that put on you guys? Um, I think it's uh, a pressure that we can handle. We know that there's an expectation for us to finish a little bit higher this year than last year. And we, um, for ourselves, we expect to finish even higher than third place. So we're looking to finish first in the Pac-12 conference. Um, and so I think we can handle the pressure. I think it's all about like focusing on um, one moment, one now is our motto and just kind of taking it game by game. 
the I'm one slogan. It kind of helps out going into the heart of conference play, mm -hmm. which you guys have coming up. The two Arizona schools coming yeah. this weekend. What are you working on to prepare for them specifically? Um, we're pretty much focusing on ourselves. We know um, the other teams are going to try to break us down, but we just need to focus on doing what we know how to do best, which is keeping the ball, keeping it moving, and just working on our attack and really taking advantage of the chances that we have. So you talked about how you're primarily a defender. Mm -hmm. I know your two sisters played <laughs> collegiately. Your mom was a track star at Rutgers. How did they kind of help you get to where you are now? Well, I always grew up like around soccer. So from when I was little, I just remember like being at the field and like when my sisters were practicing, I would have a ball. So I kind of just grew up in the soccer lifestyle. Um, and both of my sisters were defenders who ended up being moved up into attackers. So it's kind of like the same thing. We're all following in their footsteps. Um, but it was definitely a, a good thing to watch growing up to you know learn from them. And you're definitely more than just one dimensional with the <laughs> soccer aspect. You have some hobbies, especially with art. Yeah, art. Um, art is definitely something that I've always been involved with. Ever since I was little, I used to like enter art competitions and like win like five hundred dollars for like one piece. <laughs> and then um, on the side, I used to volunteer and do like face painting at parties and things like that. And then one of the parents one day came up to me and was like, "Could you do like my friend's birthday party?" And I was like, "Well, maybe I could just like use this to my advantage." And um, you know, I know I'm going to college soon, so it wouldn't help to have some extra money in my pocket. So um, I just kind of did it as like a side business and we'll like do like events and birthday parties and things for school and I painted a, a mural once in a, an elementary school. Wow, you're gonna have to doll me <laughs> up one of these Well, thanks a lot for joining me today, man. Thank you so much. You can uh, make sure to catch her and the rest Thank of the you. women at Troy as they take on Arizona State this Friday at McAllister Field. Now to Ben to check out what else is happening around the USC sports world. Thanks, Connor. It's time to bring you the latest on all the other teams around campus. It's time to light the torch. The number one USC women's volleyball team pulled out another winning weekend as they improved to 16-0 on the season with two wins over the Washington schools. Led by senior outside hitter Samantha Bricio, who matched her season high with 27 kills, the women of Troy pulled out a thriller over the Huskies despite 27 tied scores in the fourth set alone. After the game, one player explained what makes this team so special. It's like the it's like a kind of like a feeling, I guess, that makes sense that we get when we play. Like we're all excited to come into the gym and practice and even when we're like watching film and like nitpicking or whatever, like we still look forward to like trying to get better and trying to look forward to the next game kind of thing. With Sunday's sweet 16th win, USC has now already tied its win total from last year and it marks the fourth time the team has started 16-0 under head coach Mick Haley. The women of Troy will head to Colorado to take on the Buffaloes on Friday. The number three USC men's water polo team made a huge splash in the water as they took down number two Stanford in San Jose State over the weekend. USC gave up five straight goals to Stanford at the end of regulation to force overtime, but the Trojans rallied to outscore the Cardinal 4-0 in extra time to secure a 12-8 victory. Confidence was flying high after the win. I think it just gives us confidence that we can beat any team because they're a real tough team. They, uh, they push UCLA. And UCLA is the top team at the moment, so and if we can beat them by four goals, I think we can beat anyone. USC will look to add to its four-match winning streak as the team stays close to home for the Cap 7 SoCal Invitational this weekend in Malibu. Well, this torch is running on fumes, so let's kick it over to Kristen for some of this week's top tweets. Thanks, Ben. Here at USC, athletes can do it all. From classes to practice and even to their Twitter game, USC is top of the line. In case you missed out during the bye, I skimmed the best of the best of social media to bring you the top tweets of the week. Taking the number three spot this week is sophomore co cross-country athlete Mackenzie Peace. She pointed out what all students have been wondering when she tweeted, at USC, we aren't allowed to park by the Tudor Center, and now I'm just lost and confused. We feel your pain, Mackenzie. Next up is senior tailback Soma Vanuku, who tweeted, So some dude from The Bachelor is in my class. Sorry, not sorry, I have absolutely no idea who you are. Guess we know who won't be taking home the final rose next year. And finally, taking the number one spot this week is a man of very few words. Offensive lineman Zach Banner took to Twitter this weekend saying, Girls suck. Not all of us, Zach. There's still some good ones out there. Not even a bye week could hold these athletes from getting their game on. Well, at least online. That's all for me. Connor, back to you. Thanks, Kristen. While the players in jerseys get most of the attention, it's the managers that make it all happen behind the scenes. 
Beverly Pham gives us an inside look on life as a USC football manager. These days we get there usually an hour before practice and we're there setting up pads, setting up uh, the trash cans for a dummy offensive line. Just helping with drills during the day with balls, with, with all those kind of things. In terms of practice days, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a grind but it's a fun time. Hey, Marshall is, uh, he's our manager for our, uh, the running backs. And uh, I mean, he does everything full speed and makes sure that he gives it 110%. Without them, drills won't be set up, uh, the field wouldn't be set up, our jerseys wouldn't be ready. Everything for us to function as a team and in practice and before games is uh, all dependent on our managers. Game days, we usually get uh, to the Coliseum six hours before the game. We set up the field and then get in the locker room already, so setting up jerseys, uh, putting the jerseys on pads, um, all that good stuff, making sure everything looks good. They're just like coaches, assistant coaches, you know, they got to know how practice operate and from the game standpoint, they got to have all the sheets ready. They, you know, especially Marshall, he counts every rep that the running backs are doing. He knows the game, he understands the game, you know, exactly what we need. And his overall knowledge of the game is so important and, and to have a guy that, that understand football and helps out. I'm Marshall Charrington and I'm a USC football student manager. Right on. Thanks, Beverly, for that insider look. While the managers are shining the helmets, some of the guys are on the field are working on their celebrity looks. This week at Sports Scene, we noticed some interesting similarities between some of the USC football team and some celebrities. First off, we have my personal favorite, defensive coordinator Justin Wilcox and NBA forward, power forward Pau Gasol. Next is wide receiver coach T. Martin and actor Nonzo Anozzi. Anozzi has starred in Game of Thrones, Conan the Barbarian, and Cinderella. Third up is USC linebacker Scott Felix and none other than the great Tim Riggins himself. Last but certainly not least is cornerback Adore Jackson and rapper ASAP Rocky. Thanks for joining us here on the sports scene. Make sure to catch Pau Gasol and Tim Riggins out on the field Thursday night at 6 to take on Washington. And tune in next week as we look forward to the trip to Notre Dame and volleyball's fight with number 5 Arizona State. Enjoy your week everybody. Three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three,